All right, thank you, Randolph. Uh, welcome everybody to the Warlock of Graph Table Mountain. Come on, clicker. There we go. Uh, I'm Chris Hyde. Uh, yeah, honored to be here presenting to you all. I'm very excited to be the uh, warm up act, if you will, for Mala. So I'm going to give you a very kind of light intro to SQL Graph, and then Mala's going to take it from there and do a much deeper dive uh, than I'm getting into. So when I was a kid growing up in the UK, I was obsessed with this series of game books called Fighting Fantasy. Uh, so these are the type of books where at every paragraph, you have choices that you can make and they will tell you another paragraph in which you can go to. Now, I don't know whether these were big in Canada like they were in the UK. Uh, I know they weren't big here in the US where I am now, but they're similar in that regard to the choose your own adventure books that you may have seen. You know, with one difference being that you had statistics and you'd have combat, so you'd have to roll dice almost like a, a book version of Dungeons and Dragons. And so, you know, th those of you who've seen me present before, I know there's a couple, you know that I really enjoy Python. And a couple of summers ago, I was looking to kind of stretch my uh, Python abilities. So I thought, well, I'm going to code a game. I'm going to get started uh, you know, in game programming. And I'll, I remember all these books that I used to love. You know, I'll start off by coding you know, the game of one of them. So I, you know, I downloaded some stuff and started working on it. And the first thing I did was, well, I need to have all the locations set up for the game. So I found a map, and you know this is what the beginning of you know the first book looks like. You go into the dungeon, and your very first choice, you can go left or right. So let's say you go left and you go into this hallway. Well, do you go further down the hallway? Do you go into one of these rooms? Maybe I went further down the hallway. Now I've got the choice of going left or right again. Yeah, on and on. But just in this very small area, we have all these different locations and choices. But if you draw some lines to them, oh, and then we take the map away, well, what do we have? We have a graph. So then I was thinking, well, you know what? You know, maybe I don't even need Python for this. Maybe I can just use the SQL graph features. Oh, yeah, you know what? If I do that, and, you know, let's say I forget about the combat and the dice rolling bit and just do the moving from location to location. You know, I can do this with two tables and one stored procedure. I can knock this out in like 10 minutes. So, so that's what I did. Uh, and so for those of you who haven't seen graph tables before, here's a very quick introduction. I'm sure Mala will go into more detail coming up. But let's say, you know, this is me on Facebook. And I'm friends with Meredith and Malik, but not Keith. And Malik and Keith are friends. Meredith and Malik are friends. So there are different relationships. If you represent the people as nodes, that nodes is the SQL Server term, vertex, uh, you'll often hear in you know, other graph databases. Those nodes are people, and those relationships are edges. You know, there's some way of connecting one node to another. Now, with Facebook, you can't be somebody's Facebook friend, but they're not your friend. So it's monodirectional. SQL implements this more like Twitter. We're here. You know, I follow Meredith. Meredith follows me. For me, I follow Malik, but Malik doesn't follow me back. So this is kind of how things work in SQL. So we have our node table that contains you know, Chris, Meredith, Malik, Keith, and we have the edge table that represents who follows who. And then you can put other information in the node table. So the node for me might have some information about me, might have my logon info. You know, the edge table might have, okay, when did I start following Malik? But it's info about that specific relationship there. So we'll go ahead and you know, create these very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to create a table for the sections. And if I just 
into uh, the book, we see like section 289 here has a bunch of text. So we'll call the section ID 289. The text we'll put into a character field, and that's our node. And then if we query the node table, we see we have this additional field, this node ID with a GUID after it. And that's the internal component that you know, identifies within this graph table. This is a node, and this points to you know, the section table. Then I create the edge table, which in my case is going to be the choices. So if we have a choice to go to two different paragraphs, I'm going to include you know, what the text is for each that. It might be, you know, if you turn left, go to paragraph 71. If you turn right, go to paragraph 278, for example. And then we put an order so that we can you know, just put them in the right order uh, when we present them back to uh, the viewer. And so the edge table has actually three then internal columns. We've got our edge ID, which is kind of the equivalent of our primary key, you know, roughly. And then we've got our from and our two nodes. Uh, and I'll show you how that how we do the inserts for those uh, coming up. But you can see in the first row that it points to, you know, section 116 is where it starts, and it goes to uh, the section with ID 117. Well, let's jump over to Management Studio and show you how the, the code works of the game. So the insert into the section, very, very easy. Remember, we just have the ID and the text. So I uh, you know, found a PDF of this, ran it through OCR, and dropped it into my, uh, my SQL. Now we can see yeah, just very simple, very simple inserts. Jump to the end, we can see what those look like. And then we'll go ahead and do our insert into the choice. And in the choice, you know, we saw that we've only got the, the text and the order, but we also have to link it up. So the choice is that edge. So we have to have the starting node and the ending node. So to do that, we've got you know, a little uh, mini query in parentheses that selects the from node and selects the to node. And when we've got that, we create one stored procedure to manage all of this. We'll just, uh, you know, I like to have things nicely spaced. So I'll set a variable for a carriage return line feed. You know, I'll select my description for the section that we went into. And then I will add to that the choices and where they lead to. And let's look at that from a little closer. We can see that I've got a section, a choice, and a section. And so I'm using section twice, so I'm aliasing it. So we've got the current section, which is the paragraph we're reading, and our different choices pointing to you know, one or more possible sections. And look at that match. That's the key. You'll notice there's no on clause in our from. We have to join things up with our match. And if you kind of squint a little bit, you can see that you know it's almost graphical. It's in the shape of an arrow. We go from our current section, dash through our choice, you know, dash to our possible section. And then I'll just put them in the order of the choice order. And then if we go to start playing, we'll you know, turn to the prologue. And we'll run through the prologue. Okay, I won't read the whole thing. It tells us to turn to one. And here's where we start. We enter the dungeon. Uh, will we go west or east? So let's go west. And so on and so forth. So we can actually, you know, within just a couple of minutes, you know, play this very simple game uh, that we've set up. Uh, so that's really it. Uh, you know, super quick introduction. Uh, the one thing I did wanted to fit in but just didn't have time to is there's a function called shortest path that you can use. So I could take my starting paragraph and my ending paragraph 
and put those in, and the graph algorithm will go through and find the quickest way to get from point A to point B. So it'll tell me how to win the game, which is brilliant. I was going to say it's like solving solving a Rubik's cube, but it's kind of exciting. That's right. It's uh, I would, yeah, it's cheating, but. I you know, wish I'd had that as a kid, let's say, for some of these books. Uh, so that's it for me. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to take them. Otherwise, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing what Mal has got to say about graph databases. Thanks. Yeah, this is this was awesome. Really, uh, really good practical example. I loved it. Good job. Thank you. And I do remember both of those series of books. So uh, yeah, that's a throwback. Excellent. I, I was worried I was aging myself a little too much by using those oh, as examples. Uh, my beard's great too, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should have uh, made sure I touched up that intro picture before I sent it over to Randolph. <laughs> Uh, at least we're not in a state agent territory where the pictures are unrecognizably old. No, you're still recognizable, and and we give you we give you a little bit of pandemic forgiveness, so it's all good. Thank you, Chris. That was that was a good overview. I like the application of this technology for that. Um, yeah, it is a call back to to a simpler time, but I do like I do like that it's that it's possible, and you know, building a gaming engine in a database is something that some people have thought about, but this seems to be a much more practical way of doing it. So thank you. So good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this talk is on a SQL graph. I was actually planning to do a little bit more advanced talk today, but unfortunately I had no time to prepare for it. This talk, I've given this at a few places and I want to thank you, Randolph, and the chapter for letting me speak on it again. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I have been a SQL Server database engineer since DBA database engineer since a very long time, since 1996. And I was also part of the PASS organization almost since the time, about two years after they started and until it died about um, two years ago, I was very much a part of that. That's how I grew my network. Um, I currently co-lead uh, two different chapters. One is a local SQL Server user group along with Kevin Fiesel and Tracy Borgiano and also the data platform Women in Tech, which is a passion for me, um, is to help um, women uh, gain their, uh, you know, gain their their rightful stance in the tech world. And I co-lead this group with Leslie Andrews. Currently, I used to be with Kathy Kellenberger before this. Um, I can be reached on Twitter. That is my preferred uh, way of communicating with the community. It is uh, my Twitter tag is SQLMAL. So the goals for today's talk. Initially, this talk was a one hour talk entirely on SQL Graph, or at least it was meant to be. So I want to give you a little bit of history before I jump into this because I think it's important. Um, and the way it has evolved, I started talking on this in the year 2017. SQL Graph was introduced in SQL Server 2016. So 2017 was when I, I got interested in it because I had learned a bit of graph theory in school and uh, I was really excited that SQL Server is going to have this as part of it and um, started playing with it back then. And this talk uh, was, initially about SQL graph entirely. Uh, what happened though is that um, subsequently over the years, we know several versions of SQL Server have come out since 2016 and uh, hate to say it, but uh, the feature hasn't evolved all that much or at least not to the extent it should to truly call it a graph database. It does have some nice features and Chris already showed you some of those and I will be showing those two as well as some applications of that. It is useful, but it is not on the same line. You cannot call it a graph database when you compare it with similar products in the market. So it has been somewhat limited and as it happens with the mothership, sometimes is that they introduce features and then they test out the traction and it doesn't probably pick up. So 
it just stays where it is and that's where it has been the past three years it hasn't evolved all that much three to four it's almost five years now anyway it's more or less the same so i'll show you what it can do now but i don't want you to think this is a full-fledged graph database so i divided this presentation into two halves the first half will be more about graph theory and i think if you are a data person you really need to know a bit of graph theory whether or not you use sql graph is not that important but you have to understand and be able to recognize graph data when you see it and then find the right tools to make good use of this. So that's really important. So the first half of my presentation will be explaining to you what is graph data, where, where are the different places that you normally see it and such. And then in the second half, we'll get into what SQL graph can do for this reason. So the goals for today is uh, what is graph data? What are its origins? Uh, how did it get started? History around it. Why is it that important to learn? Why should you learn? And then some basic terminology around modeling, data modeling for graph databases. Then SQL graph and what it can do. So why is this important to follow? This is a little bit old, but not that old. You can see the dif different types of databases here. Um, clearly relational is the big chunk you know, of biggest piece of the pie. And then you have graph, which is this green thing to the right, and it is pretty decent size. It is pretty big. So we know if you're in today's world, you need to know more than just relational if you want to call yourself a database person. And graph is a big part of that. This is why I said it's important to understand graph theory and it's important to recognize graph data when you see it. So because it is a, it is a big part of all these things that are getting to be popular and um, where you know finding the right fit for the right kind of data. So graph, how many people uh, recognize this piece of art? Anyone? I, I recognize, I do recognize it, but I don't know who the artist is. So the art, artist is a guy named Isha, uh, E-S-C-H-E-R. Um, and his art is, a, if you're the kind of visual person like, like I am, his art is a great way to understand how graph data is laid out. And of course, he had no concept of graph data or anything. He just, he was just a genius at drawing three-dimensional stuff like this. He's done a lot of stuff like this. And some of it is like, you know, it really makes you giddy looking at it. Extremely intricate, really, you know, really uh, work of a genius. But this is how graph data is technically. So if as, as I get more into it, you can see why. And this is a great visual way of understanding um, how it looks. So Joe Selko's quote, and everybody knows Joe, if you are into relational databases, Joe is a big proponent of doing relational theory, right? And this, these are Joe's words. So what Joe says is that what you want to see in data is not just data, it is also the relationships. This is the reason why it's important to understand graph data is when you understand what the relationships are about, not just the entities. Brief history of graph theory, how graph theory evolved. Uh, if you have listened to any talks on this, almost everybody goes into this. So I won't I won't explain this a lot, but just briefly cover it. So Konigsberg was a little uh, was a little town in, in Prussia in the in the 17th century. And the mayor of this town, this town was essentially, it was made up of two pieces of uh, two pieces of land that is connected by bridges, essentially seven different bridges. So the mayor of this town had a challenge uh, that he asked, he wanted the citizens to try to walk from one end of this town to another and not crossing this bridge more than once. Now, if you've been a kid, you have had the similar similar puzzle given to you at school, like hundreds of times, like don't take your pencil off the paper, but you know, try to connect all these points together. It's sort of like that. That was the kind of challenge that he placed to the citizens of the town is you need to walk from one end of the town to another and not go over any bridge more than once. So Leonard Euler, who was a mathematician uh, who lived back then, he took this challenge and he deduced, you know, he made a mathematical theory out of it. He called each of these these landmasses, nodes, and the bridges as edges. That was what, when Chris explained nodes and edges, those terms were invented by Euler. And Euler found out that to have, 
to to actually accomplish what the mayor mayor suggested you need to have no more than two edges that have odd number of connections coming out of them so in other words if you got rid of one of these bridges you could do what he said so that's how it and his like it is with any mathematical um, theory that has a lot to it more than what i just said but what is relevant to what we are trying to understand is this that much it's about nodes edges and the connections and these are the terms that uh, leonard euler invented uh, back then so that's how uh, that's how it evolved from there uh, that gave rise to what is called graph theory and that's what has later come down to graph databases so what exactly do we mean by graph data when somebody says graph this is what i learned about graphs when i was in school is like an x and y axis and a line like this so this is not this has nothing to do with graph data it has nothing to do with with graphs like this what graph data essentially is when you look at the relational uh, a relational er diagram it looks like this but when you look at a at a graph data model it looks more like this where these circles are your entities and these big arrows and these arrows are uh, you know intentionally very thick because there are more relationships than there are entities so anything that is modeled in this way this is called graph data so if you see a diagram a data model that looks that makes use of these circles and these arrows that connect them that is essentially what we call graph data so graph data that is more about relationships than it is about entities so in the relational world our focus is overwhelmingly on what the tables and the entities are about but graph data essentially it is more about what connects those entities together and then you should have it's not a simple one to one connection it needs to be highly interconnected so there are basically the way to see it is the number of connections way of are exponentially higher than the number of entities in the graph world so it is not just any connection when you have a, a type of data where the number of connections between entities is way more than the entities themselves that's what qualifies for calling it graph data and there are complex the, the relationships are like really really complex and we'll see some examples of how so these are some common examples that, you know if you look at these things these are things we see every day in the world all around us and we look at them like social media graph like person a is connected to person b person b is connected to person c and you know how the bubble evolves the connections so social graph is the most common example of of uh, graph data then you have buyer behavior you have amazon telling you all the time hey you bought this do you want to buy these three other things or somebody like the movie like this so who are the other people who like the same movie stuff that you get on netflix or amazon you know movie stuff like that so buyer behavior buyer behavior is a kind of graph and the gps that we use every day how is place a connected to place b how do you get from here to there and what are your options do you take the same route do you want to avoid highways do you want stops in between all these things you know lot of connections so geospatial data is a great example and in the in the data center when you have you have bill of materials like this modeling and storing hierarchies that like if you are a manufacturing shop then you have the list of things you need to make something so that makes for a bill of materials the complete breakdown of things that you need to make something that is a hierarchy employee org chart i'm pretty sure if you've been a sql server person at some point everybody has dealt with you know crazy org org chart queries and i'll show some of them so employee org chart is a kind of graph and security model like data users and permissions like you know the whole hierarchy of what translates into into permissions who has access to what this database this website this kind of you know dependencies like that so that security model that makes for a, a graph especially in large organizations where there are multiple hierarchies and you know complex interdependencies this makes for a very good candidate for for that and then data center management this is among my favorites and this is something that i am trying to work on where i am is what are the dependencies what happens if this one server goes down what are all the points that get hit 
like this this app this website this page goes down you know some job that is dependent on it some report something else okay some other server that's making a linked server call to this server all these dependencies right these make for for a graph data model as well and then fraud detection if you've ever been called by your credit card company like you know there were three charges that there were three purchases that i made on uh, some website from india that i'm sending gifts to my family back there so i get a call from chase asking you know what are you doing is that really you so fraud detection operates on the basis of patterns they see right if this one person is uh, this one credit card is suddenly making 99% of all my shopping is in the us and suddenly today i'm i'm shopping on three websites in in some other country that means either somebody has stolen my credit card or something bad might have happened so that's how they look at it and fraud detection is a big part of graph data is how what is connected to what and what are patterns and essentially this is what i, um, I is differentiates sql graph from other graphs too is this kind of pattern detection is inbuilt into other graph databases and in the relational world that's pretty hard to pull off so fraud detection is a big reason why many companies use graph data models so these are some of the examples and this is again another reason why we need to understand this data in detail is because we deal with this kind of stuff every day and if we work at a place where we run into this kind of stuff and we can do it better more power to us you know we you know we have advantage knowing it so history of databases essentially what we call graph database is a combination of a storage engine and a query language now with sql graph we know in the storage engine is sql server the query language is tsql so it really kind of the same thing bundled together but as other graph databases are not quite like that so most of the other offerings are one of these two or they tend to mix and match like they have a storage engine but they have multiple query languages that can pull data out of that engine so essentially the first graph database was the ibm network data model um, this was in the 1970s but this this is hardware based and this did not have a query language so you had to know the insights of the hardware if you had to use it but this was the original graph database is the, the what ibm made for their network data model that is uh, in the, somewhere in the 1970s and then we have the relational model that came around in the 80s and we've been querying graph data using the relational model for a seriously long time until no sql and everything around it started we've been doing it the relational way and i'll go into all the other ways that all the different algorithms that we use in the relational world for this but essentially after you know 1980s up until the no sql movement started relational database were where graph data used to reside and graph databases started not not very new not very old somewhere in the 2000s and uh, neo4j claims that they are the first graph data vendor there is no uh, evidence to that and some people are uh, you know contesting that claim but essentially along with the no sql movement came the idea of a full fledged graph database that is somewhere in the 2000s so you can really see it is not really all that old now i'm going to show you some of the terminology around graph data modeling briefly and it's not all that hard it's not as difficult as um, relational data modeling so nodes essentially nodes are what we call entities in the relational world so i use my example is the imdb movie data set because everybody likes movies so nodes are essentially i have two basic nodes one is two basic entities if i can call it that one is movies and one is the person person could be anyone a, a viewer or a director or an actor or anyone so well it could it be me as well yeah of course <laughs> so so movies and person are two entities if you want to look at it that way and then edges are how these things are connected so the arrow stands for edges and then degrees refer to the number of arrows that come out of each node so out of movies you have like you know movies is connected to genre so that is one arrow here and then person is connected to movies in two different ways could have acted in the movie could have produced in the movie could have seen you know i could add more arrows here this is just an example 
but the number of arrows is what we call degrees. So this this entity, this node has two arrows coming out of it, so it has two degrees. That has one and this has three. So this is the terminology that you use for data modeling is you call it degrees. And then you have what is called a directed edge and a non-directed edge. So an example, you could say a directed edge is a one directional relationship. Like for example, you follow someone on Twitter. That is a one sided relationship. Or and the, the other one is you friend somebody on Facebook. So there is no that's not that's not one sided. That is bidirectional. So that is called in the graph world as a non directed edge. So these are just these are the, the simple terms that you need to remember if you're trying to model a graph database. Basically nodes, vertices, edges, the two types of edges and the degrees or what how many edges come out of each node. Then a little bit more what we call cycles. Cycles are essentially about relationships or node that that complete each other or go into a circle. So I am friends with Randolph Randolph is friends with Chris. Chris is friends with me. So that makes for a complete circle. So this is what we call graph circles and the reason why you need to understand that these exist is mostly for programming and programming and we are not going to go that deep in this presentation, but programming for cycles you have to follow certain algorithms that make it easier and such and not all graph data has cycles, but Let's just understand that these things exist. That's that's literally all it is. Cycles are when you can have relationships that connect to one another and then form form a cyclical uh, thing. And then the other one, the non cyclical model is what we call tree, a hierarchy or the org chart. So, you know, the guy on top and then the person on top and then you have two people reporting to him and then multiple people reporting to them and it goes down. So hierarchies like this, these are one directional graphs and these don't have cycles. So the algorithms you use for this kind of stuff is maybe a little bit different, but these are also these are also graphs, although they may not look like that. These are also graphs and these are one directional. And then uh, some of the examples of the graph database that I said, uh, popular graph databases are Neo4j, unarguably, you know, most people seem to be using that. There are several others in the market, and there are also popular graph querying languages like Cypher, SparkQL, Gremlin, and such. And like I said before, most people who are into serious graph implementations have a combo of these things. Like they have one type of database implementation, and they have multiple languages that they use to query or get information out of it. So just there to understand that SQL graph is not here along with any of this stuff. This is serious graph stuff. So these are the databases and the query languages that are in the market for it, or at least those that are popular. So some of the um, comparisons between relational and graph. So essentially, like I said, it's about connections, like a relational um, ER diagram looks like that, but if you have a diagram for a graph, it's going to look something like what you see on the right, like a lot of relationships. So really difficult to focus on a, a tiny part like that clearly because of so many relationships. Um, relational has been around for a very long time since 1980s. We know graph is very new and everybody if you've been a technologist, you know all technology evolves with time. So most people they don't choose to go the graph database way because it is still very new and being tested out. So that may be, you know, good reason, especially with databases. Graph databases are fairly new. Uh, pattern matching, I gave an example before of fraud detection. Uh, the biggest reason why companies get into serious graph implementations is for the purpose of pattern matching. Two examples, one is fraud detection. The second one is customer likes You know this. So what are the other products that the customer may like? that kind of stuff. I work for an e-commerce company. That kind of pattern matching is really important to us. So that is intuitive with graph databases. SQL graph in a relational world, that's really hard to make it happen. Relational databases are not object oriented and pattern matching is seriously object oriented stuff. So you don't have that kind of stuff in the relational world. Visualization, obviously not. I would say this is the biggest, you know, 
what is really hard about SQL Graph is we don't even have a decent Power BI plugin for it. We have no way of seeing what the graph data is about. No visualization yet. So, but almost all other graph uh, products, they come in with great visualization. Neo4j, like I said, for example, the visuals are just awesome on that. So even a person who's not very tech savvy, they can easily see, you know, what is connected to what and how, and they can make business decisions based on that. So that is a big part of the graph database is visualization. So these are the main, uh, you know, the biggest differences between graph implementation in the relational world and graph database as an entity, as its own technology. Then the query basis, which is really important. Uh, relational query is based on tables, um, roughly what you call objects in the, C in the SQL Server world, although they're not really objects, but we can call them that. Uh, and with graph, it is relationship based. That is, you query on the relationship, not on the entities. So that is an important difference to remember that the basis of your query is different. So why bother with a different tool? So we've had we've had graph, you know, data in relational databases for like almost like, you know, since 1980s. So why should we even bother with a different tool or you know even learn SQL Graph, which is a little bit different? It really depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. So part of the reason why I would say, this is just my opinion, I would say why SQL Graph did not take off in a big way with the user base is because the problems that you can solve with this particular SQL Server implementation has already been solved in other SQL Server you know, algorithms using it. So it wasn't providing a big gain in that way. That's the reason why you know it didn't take off in a big way. So it really depends on the problem. If you have a problem where you, you get you know, big gains out of using graph data, then it's important to look into. Um, you don't have the luxury of code savvy people, right? So machine learning, a lot of graph problems are solved, like pattern matching. People use a lot of Python programming and things like that to, to solve, you know, find patterns in data, even though your basic storage is still relational. That's one way to do it. But very few places have the luxury of hiring people who are who can actually do that. Who can write write code that does the same thing that a, a graph database can do. So that may be if you're in a situation like that, then you may need to look into something like that. And then depends on the volume of data. And this is where SQL Graph may be advantageous is because you just have something really small. You have maybe an org chart or you have a bill of material or you have like one or two specific cases where you need the usage of graph, then it's a good option. You know, it is not worth uh, for you to spend a lot of money on a vendor based product and to move your data there or ETL it every night and then worry about whether that thing has any HADR and all that kind of stuff. So really it depends on the volume of data. If your data is really small, you're not a social media company or that sort of a thing, then you know, you're know you okay with, with SQL Graph. So these are the specific, or you may even be okay with the implementation you did, you know, the older forms of relational implementations of graph if your volume of data is really small and it's working satisfactorily. So the reasons why you need to bother with a different tool essentially depend on these things only is that if you have a big problem, uh, you don't have people who are very code savvy and you don't have a lot of, you know, you have significant data that merits its own uh, graph database. So what are the types of problems that you know, you know you're trying to solve with with a specific graph implementation related how is person a x related to person y now i've used linkedin for this a lot of times and i found it very useful is if i'm interviewing somewhere i go and look to see if anyone in my network is working at that place or if i had even know someone who's two or three connections away who's working at that place so that's typically what it is how is how is person X and Y related, trying to solve that kind of problems. Pattern matching, like I just said, you know, sales are similar in one area to another area, buying patterns and, you know, fraud detection, that kind of stuff. And then some other things like centrality and car clustering and who is the most popular person in my network. Like somebody totally outside, you know, the SQL community wants to come in, wants to find out who has my boss. My boss was completely, you know, 
poorly informed about any any kind of SQL family or SQL community stuff. And when my boss got on Twitter, you know, within an hour he knew that Brent Ozar had the, the greatest number of followers in our community. Nobody told him. Nobody gave him any tips or anything. It's just that you go and you you try to make your connections and you tell the app what you're looking for, then it knows that this person is probably the most influential person in your network. So you may want to follow that. So who is the most popular person in your network? That is something that graph databases help you find. And what part of the network, this, this network and that network are not the same. No, stupid wording. I, I'm sorry for that. So this network essentially means your, your network at work, the computer network. So what happens if something fails here? Like what if this server goes down? What are the other things that are impacted? So the influence like that. So these are the kind of problems that essentially your graph your graph data implementation is going to help you solve. So I'm sure I think this uh, slide is a little ahead of its time, but OK, yeah, it is. So onwards to what what you probably came here to learn, that is SQL graph. So why I'll get into why SQL graph is important to learn if you choose to learn it and then show you a demo of uh, other things. So why SQL Server versus a full-fledged database? So because this blended approach, like I said, it can be advantageous because you have just a small amount of data that qualifies for SQL, uh, you know, for graph implementation. Um, it's less code. It, you know, that is probably the biggest advantage with using the graph implementation is that it is really simple, easy to code. It's really less code, more intuitive. And you know, only a little bit of data. You you don't have a lot of data, and you have the advantages of SQL Server that time tested. You know, you have your ACID and HA and all that taken care of, as opposed to some NoSQL vendor that you don't really know and you don't trust your data. There, um, you have all these things going on. So SQL Graph architecture. I think Chris covered some of this. Essentially, it is uh, really simple. It's a node table and an edge table, and uh, how those two are connected. So let me show you an example. Any questions, uh, Randolph, yet? I don't see any hands up, but uh, we're all fascinated because I'm having a private chat with uh, Evan and we're we're loving this, so keep going. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad to hear. So is, um, can you see, can you see? We can see SSMS. Is it possible to make it a little bit bigger? Yeah. I think okay here. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah. Perfect. That good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to create the simple uh, database that I said. You know, I showed you in the data model, which is the person and movies. So I'm going to. I'm in the right database. Drop table and create. I'm creating this as a node table. So I'll let you see what it created here. So essentially, this is the same thing that Chris showed you, which is this is the primary key graph ID node. These are both system generated. And then I added two things that I wanted here, um, which is person ID and person name. So this thing doesn't care if you want to define your own primary key like you do with any other table. So these things are system generated and these things are unique internally. It does not keep you from defining what you want to define um, as your primary key. If you want to give this person uh, you know, an ID for whatever reason, then you, you can do that. That's essentially what it is. And you can see that you can see what uh, are the other things. It's a unique, they just put a unique, unique index here. These are the enhancements that they've done. Not, not a lot, but you know, these things really do help. There is one index that comes out of the box along with it uh, that helps with the querying. And then this is the primary key and you can see all, all the rest of the stuff. Really simple, it's not all that hard. So, and then you have these are the commands that help you see whether it's a, it's a node or an edge table. So the sysdot tables has what is called is node or is edge because I chose to define this as a node. It is one here. And then if you want to see what the columns are like, so you can see here, this is a graph ID. This is a node ID. This is computed. This is a, a JSON string, and this is 
person ID and person name. So I'm going to I have my own. I have uh, the tables that I imported from my MDB. So these are my relational tables. These are already there. Um, and I'm going to insert into my graph tables from here. OK, now I'm going to create a movie node which is going to be similar to. It has some more, you know, it's a little bit bigger. But that's literally all it is. Same thing if I see well, it's node is edge, it's going to show me that it's a node. Again. OK, and then I'm going to insert into it from my tables. OK. So I have this you know, like this node is essentially you can see it's just a JSON string and it tells you that you know this ID. The name of the ID and such. So now I'm going on to create what is called the edge. That is the connection between the nodes. So the first connection I want is between movies and actor. So I don't really have any additional things that I want to add to this table. Um, I could if I wanted to, but I really don't. So I'm just going to say, OK, SQL Server, I just want an edge table. I don't want anything else. So go and give me just an edge table. So all it creates is just, you know, an edge table. There is nothing additional here. So is edge is one. You can see that for the earlier tables, it, this one was one. Now it is edge is one. And then. So these are the, you can see the number of computed tables. Sorry, the computed columns is a lot more, although it is just a simple edge table. There is a graph ID, there is a from object ID and from ID, there is all these things. Okay, now we don't have to essentially understand every one of these. So from and two, essentially three, three from and three for two. This is what it is. And these two essentially define your um, your um, one record. So all of this is you know system generated there is nothing we need to do to take care of it and then okay i don't think i need to do that okay insert into movie actors from my id to id so essentially what i do is just do a join on my relational tables and join it along with the node table i created to create my links so what it has done is to create uh, you know, join the movies and actors like this. I do it. So what it is doing is created an edge ID. It, see, it is not showing you all those other columns that it did. It's only showing you what's relevant. So this is the edge ID, and then it is connected this node to that node. And you can, if you expand this, you can see this is the node. 2727 is the node ID, and this other person is zero person ID zero, so it has connected these two. That's what it does. And no more than that. This movie director is exactly similar. Now if I wanted to, the person in me who is used to normalizing wants to create two different tables. If you want to, you have a choice of putting this. Remember, this is all no SQL based, so there is no question of normalizing anything. You really don't have to stick to creating distinct separate tables, but I like to keep it like this for clarity's sake, so I want to keep separate tables, but there is no reason why you can't keep movie director link and movie actor link as the same table. Maybe you can add something there that tells you what the link is, some kind of identifier. That's one way to do it too. You can do it like that.
Okay, same same thing as you saw with the movie actor thing. Then this is the one thing called co-actor. That is, who has co-starred with who? This is a good way to experiment with with shortest path and to see who is you know the connections between people. So I created a co-actor link and I added it a movie title like how people are related. You know where did they meet each other? That is. So I need that connection and I want to do that. And this is where you know what I'm doing here essentially is where the match clause is. The match clause is how you want to connect. So I want to see. This person acted in this movie and in this movie and you know they are not the same person. So that's how I know they are co-actors is that both of them co-starred in the same movie and they're two different people. That's how that's what this match clause tells me is from to. And it's literally all it is the way the the arrow goes is, you know, movie. Actor and then person. Movie actor and person. So if you can see the, the alias, that's how it goes. It's not into co actor. Link. That's it. OK, so we have created all the data that we needed here and then we see where I am in the slides and. Then we can look at. That's basically what I was trying to show you is the architecture of the node and the edge tables. And then how you know before I get into how what you can do with SQL graph like the algorithms, we can see how was this done on SQL Server before like before this all of this evolved. So essentially there were three algorithms that people typically use to query and create um, graph data. One is what we call adjacency list model. And this is even now this is widely in use, especially for org charts and things is keeping the parent and the child child IDs on the same uh, same record. So you have you know you your employee ID and then on it you have another one that says who is your boss. Right and that, that's the most common way most org charts are designed. So this is highly procedural in nature. If you want to query it, we know you have to write a CTE and loop through different things to construct the org chart. So that's the most common way that people use it and um, it is still widely used. Uh, second one is what we call path enumeration mode where you store the path as a string and this is called hierarchy ID. I don't know how many people have encountered this. It's not a very common implementation. Uh, my friend Louis Davidson has a really good chapter on this in his in his book on database design. But this is one way to implement it is to store how the the connections, how the hierarchy is in a string, literally in an XML string in in the in the in the data as part of your data. This is one way that you have to do it and then you have to parse that to understand how things are connected. The next one is the nested sets model. Um, I have encountered this at one place where I worked. It is an absolute nightmare. That is you keep the the left and the right side of the connection as some sort of a ratio. You store it like this, like you know, men is connected to this one on the clothing on the left and then to the suit on the right and suit is again connected to men on the left and this one on the right and you have to pass these numbers to get the path. It is an absolute querying nightmare if you ever you know had something like this but this is one way that people used to do things and these are the three ways that that we adopted before we had graph data implementations to query on and to keep you know keep our um, our graph data going so what are the algorithms that we are looking to make better with this particular uh, SQL graph implementation is like Chris said, it's the shortest path. Shortest path essentially is what we call six degrees of separation is how this one entity is connected to another entity. What are all the interconnections like like what LinkedIn shows you? So that that is um, that is the most biggest and most significant gains of using this model and also for querying hierarchies like if you have bill of materials or if you want org charts i show you the the different ways you can do it and what what how it was done before and how it is how you can do it with with sql graph so these are mainly the two algorithms that you can possibly use with sql graph to make it better remember like i said before if it's a full fledged graph database we can look at a whole bunch of other things like pattern matching and this and that but with, with this one these are the two main things that we have to stick with so let me go back to the demo 
simple query comparisons. Okay. Question one, I want to answer who acted in which movie. If I want to use my relational database to do that, what I do is to construct a join like this, like movies, movies actor and actor, and then I just I pick a movie and I join, make a simple join like this. You know, movie ID equals movie ID actor ID like this, and then I supply a title, and then it comes back with the responses. If I want to do it with my graph data, what I say is movies to actor. This is the edge table. A is the edge table. M is M is the node, as you can see, and P is the node, and A is the edge that's connecting the node. So I put A in the center, and then I say movies to person, and movie title equals the same thing. So as you can see, you know, it's a little bit simpler than your original thing. You just have to understand how to construct the. The match query. Now we want to see who is the most prolific actor who has acted in the most movies. So I do a select top with with the number of joins and I order it by the number of movies that person has acted in. So I do this. And then it comes up with all these names, right? A simple join based thing. Now, if I want to do it by using the thing, all I have to do is to replace the joins with my match clause, just like I showed there, the node connected by the edge table. Then I group by the same and order. So this is just your node and edge tables because they are still under the cover. They're still relational tables. You can use your group by and all this stuff and you know do the same thing. So same results. So now we get a little bit deeper. You want to see all the actors who are directors. So I have to join all of this, right? Join multiple joins like this. And you come up with join movies actor, join to individual the actor table, then movies director, director table, and then equate the two. So I'm constructing a number of joins here. Ignore the spaces, bad data. But otherwise, this is what it comes up with is uh, when you want to see actors who are directors. Look at how simple it is with the graph way of doing it. All I have to do is just say movies with this director and movies with the actor. It is just one line as compared to that many joins. So that's the biggest advantage is uh, people want to write simple code. Then it's really easy to do it. Same thing. Then this is the shortest path is that you want to find all the actors who are, let's say, who are connected to Harrison Ford. Now the syntax for this may be a little bit clunky to understand. Once you get the hang of it, it's easy. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm trying to construct a string that tells me how this person knows Mr. Ford, like which movie did he act with? And then I'm also trying to see what, what is his name and how many hops away he is like LinkedIn, he or she or they is because uh, like LinkedIn tells you that that person is so many hops away. You need to know you if you know that it makes it easy for you to understand your connections. So what I'm doing here is exactly that. So it's telling me these are his connections. This is the name of the person he's connected to. This is the movie in which he may have met that person. This is the friend's name and the level is just, you know, they co-starred in one movie. So just one. So if we go down this further. Now there may be two movies between them. So if that's the case, if he, he has not acted directly with Mr. Hopkins, but he met Brad Pitt and Brad Pitt knows Mr. Hopkins and these are the movies that they may have met so two hops away so that's how it is and it helps you understand specifics so if you want to know exactly if you want to get to two specific people you can just do a sub query of the same thing you want to know how person a and person b are connected or if they are connected so i want to know if james franco has any connection at all to harrison ford so i run a query like this then I see that, you know, it tells me. Basically no direct connection, so. There are three hops away, so. 
he's acted with Brad Pitt in this movie. Then this person acted with here and then another hop here. And then finally you get to Mr. Franco, who is three hops away. So this is how it is useful. And basically the kind of stuff that you can see on LinkedIn, you can do with this sort of stuff. So it is really cool if you know how to use it. There are some disadvantages to it and I'll get to that a little later. But if your requirements are fairly simple like this, like to understand if you are able to construct your data model really well, it is it's really cool. It's really helpful. Let's go back. Learned about the slide. This is my slide. I was here. Yeah. Shortest path and okay. Pairing hierarchies. So we saw the demo, the movie database. Okay. Now the pros and cons, and I have more demos to show, but I'll essentially explain the pros and cons because it's important to understand. SQL graph is really easy to define, easy to query, and it is much more simpler than using a second a non relational database. Uh, some of the disadvantages, like I said, these things have been around for like three or four years, so I don't think it's going to go away anytime quickly or not going to be fixed. Node and edge tables cannot be memory optimized tables. Why is this important? Because other the ways other graph databases work, they are really, really super fast in comparison. And the reason they are that quick is because all the data is loaded into memory. All the nodes and edges are in the memory. So it knows like from here to here to here, it goes like really quickly. And we the way we can do it somewhat in the in the relational world is by using hackathon tables, but we are not there. Uh, node and edge tables cannot be memory optimized yet. Uh, there is no support for CTs. I don't know if this has been fixed, but I think it is still around. Um, no built in visualization. And the last one with the shortest path is that with other graph databases, there is such a thing called weighted shortest path, which means if I want to go from here, let's say I want to go from here to my doctor's office. I want um, a route that does not have too much too much of traffic. I do not want to take highways and I want to stop on a gas station on the way. So I have ways my uh, my phone gives me options. I can specify all that and get to the shortest path over and above. You know that includes all of that stuff. So with the shortest path that we have in the SQL world, you cannot do anything like that. You cannot attach any weights to it. It just gives you what and what is more. You can have more than one shortest path between two connections. It will decide for you which one it gives you, which is kind of a bummer in my opinion. Because if you have more than one shortest path, it has to show you both and it doesn't show you both. It shows you just one, whatever it is randomly. And that's, you know, those are some of the disadvantages, but, you know, with, with using SQL graph over other other graph models right here. So before I get to references and such, I'll show you some of my other demos. Close this movie thing. So bill of materials, bill of materials essentially is like if you have something like, you know, a bicycle and you have um, a lot of parts in, you know, you have a complete list of everything that goes into making that thing. Like, you know, you have um, you have a brake, you have a pedal and then what are the components of that and on and on and on. It's like really big list and it's really useful for, you know, companies that manufacture things and such. So this is the query that uh, you know. This is the stored procedure that comes with um, with AdventureWorks, the older version of AdventureWorks, where you write a bill of materials the traditional way, that is using using an ID that tells you like you know this part is part of manufacture. This screw goes into this pedal. This pedal goes into this part of the bike, and all of that all of that information is inside your tables, and then you write you know uh, essentially a CTE, and you do an outer selector querying from the CTE with a with a recursion option. That's how you do it to to get your bill of materials out. So if you want to do it with the graph, what you do is I wrote rewrote this query with the graph thing and I'll show you what I did. Oops. 
So essentially, I made you know nodes and edges table like bill of materials node and a product assembly node, and this belongs to what part belongs? A product belongs to product is a part of this bill of material, and a product is also a part of this product assembly, and this sort of a thing. Like reduced it to something like this, and then uh, this is my store procedure. Yeah. What I wrote is I replaced all the joins with my match queries like this. Essentially, I do have to use the same thing. I have to use a CTE and I have to rejoin with the CTE using the recursion option. So it does the same thing except that my joins are like significantly simpler. So I'll show you how both of them work and they will give you the same result. So this is the one. This is the one that came with that, and this is the one using the graph. And they are essentially the same, and but the ease of querying is much easier with the graph table. So the next one is what is the org chart? Okay, the org chart is here. So the org chart that comes with with that. Which one is this? Word word importer. Actually, I forgot. But whatever it uses, what is called. Um, Hierarchy ID and hierarchy ID, like I said, it's an old implementation where you have to attach. Trying to see where exactly is. Give me one second. Yes, it is. It's graph tables. Yes. OK, so thankfully I am still here. So you can see here this get ancestor function. This is what um, this came this is the older implementation of SQL Server with hierarchy ID. What it does is to get the parent of this particular thing and you can have every entity can have just one parent. This is just the biggest disadvantages of hierarchy ID is just one single parent implementation. This was an old way of constructing um, constructing an org chart and this works fine as long as you have just one you know one parent per per entity and that is one way to do it and but with graph with the graph implementation you don't have to restrict yourself like that you can have more than one you know each thing can have more than one parent too something is wrong CD. Okay. All right. So this is how you know you can see the org chart is rather clunky way visualization, but it is there. So this guy is the top boss, and then under him he has this other person, and then this employee reports to this person, and so on. This is how an org chart is constructed. Um, and a, a sort of a visual if you want to call it that, but you can get the same result with the graph tables and you know you don't have to restrict yourself to the to that maintaining that hierarchy ID and this sort of stuff. Same thing. OK, well, I have a question. Go on. What does the uh, execution plan look like between the hierarchy and the graph? Queries because I know that hierarchy is a little bit tricky to work with. We can look at it. It's been a while since I looked at it, but we can look at it. Mm. A lot of nested loops. Yeah. Let's just look at this one. And table spool. Yeah. I saw as well. Yeah. Did I run it? Okay. 
it's doing a couple of scans. I don't think it's radically different. Yeah, I don't think it's that different. We just part oh, there's even a red look up here. Oh, it's the it's the employee node. OK. That's part of the. Part of the issue I had with, with using the using the match function too is because there are no significant performance gains um, that come with it. Um, ease of querying is pretty much the biggest gain that we can see. Right. Yep. So the last example I have, and this is one that I personally like, is the one with. So what I did is um, think of a ER diagram as as a graph model, and I constructed um, a table and an edge for tables and foreign keys, which are pretty much the graph model that we see every day on our basis is that all our ER diagrams are graph data. And so if we can use this to construct things like, you know, hierarchies of, of foreign keys and such, how is table A related to table B? If you have like, you know, 20 tables in between, it becomes it can become really hairy constructing a query um, that goes down that hierarchy. So I tried to use this to create something like that. And that's the last one I'm going to show you today. What I'm doing essentially is using using a DMB based query to populate that. I just did. Oh, 2019, okay. Three. So I'm just seeing what you know how how these tables are connected. So I can see how from table you know this is the foreign key constraint that relates this table to this table. Then I want to see a specific table. I can just say from table is that. See that, and then specific table from is also possible the same way the other way around. Then the shortest path is how do you how do you connect from one table to another? And like I said before, what's annoying about this is that SQL Server won't show you. There may be multiple paths between two tables, but it won't show you everything. It will only show you one. And so if you want to see details of all the hops, you have to go and look into. Look into something like that that tells you what goes between them and what is called in the graph theory world is transitive closer is how. Everything is connected, how. Each table is connected to every other table that is called transitive closer. So for that, you have to use a CT and you have to code a little bit around it and then it will tell you how you know how many hops are there, how each table is connected to every other table. Very useful if you have you know a complex hierarchy and you want to you want to traverse it and write queries. So that's pretty much it. These are the references. Uh, a lot of people have blogged and uh, you know written various stuff about it. There are some great articles on uh, simple talk. Um, and uh, that's literally all it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mala. I found that fascinating. This is one area, or well, one of many, but one area of SQL Server I have very little knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was great to see your perspective as well as Chris's perspective because, you know, a lot of the questions are, well, why would I want to use this? And it looks like if you've got a very complex hierarchy, just as you said, or mm -hmm. if you've got a, a data model that isn't necessarily based on a hierarchy at all, but you still do want to have relational data, then this looks like a good a good uh, way of thinking. Correct. Any questions? Are you, 
Um, I, I don't see any hands up, but uh, I did steal that question earlier about the um, about the query plan. Uh, Evan was going to ask that, but I asked it instead. Um, yeah. I, I had a question for you. How long did it take you to become familiar with thinking in a graph model as opposed to relational? And how, how much effort was it to become familiar with the querying language and stuff like that? Um. It's a bit of effort. I would say it took. It's not. It's not terribly hard. And I. I will confess that because I had a background in school with graph theory, uh, that really right. helped me. I never thought it would, but it did. Um, you know, things that you learn aeons ago that come in useful. But, but <laughs> that was helpful. So I had a sort of a foundation like that. But with that foundation, it took me about two to three months. Um, I bought. I even started down the path of writing a book on this because. I did so much research into it and I was so optimistic that Microsoft is going to make this feature bigger and better, which didn't happen. So I bundled all those books and sent them over to Chris. I'm, I'm sure he has them. <laughs> and and um, no, it took me about a couple of months, two to three months to get my head around it. And after that, it, it's actually pretty addictive. I haven't looked at it um, in too much detail recently, but it can be re it's really a lot of fun. Because there are so many uh, different data sets, you can you can have fun with using this. It is uh, if they if there is more effort put into making this feature better, it would be really really good. But for some reason, that's not happened. Well, you know, Mala, there's there's two things I have to say about that. Firstly, mm -hmm. I'm now a Microsoft employee, and so you may have suggested something that I may just pass up the line. So there's that. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, we're not recording this, so I can't commit to it. And mm -hmm. the second thing is, Microsoft is always going to look for a a market response. So if there is a demand Correct. for the Correct. for the feature Correct. to be in, improved, yeah. then yeah, they like, will uh, do it. Yes. So like my friend Greg Lowe says, there is only so far you can go with faking an object-oriented model under a relational hood. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> So you're actually faking what other things actually do in the in the object oriented world. And in that way, if you look at it, they've done a pretty good job with this whole yeah. shortest path and everything. And and look, if that's your goal, then it's a yeah. pretty good competitor to Postgres in that respect. So yeah. yeah, very interesting, very interesting area of of the product that I think some people will be looking to explore now. Uh, will you be able to make your scripts available? Oh, of course. yes, I Thank you. I'm don't remember how it's been a while since I updated my GitHub, but give me a day tomorrow. I'll have it out there for you. Oh, there's no rush uh, whenever you can. And uh, I think that would give us a, a good foundation into this. All yeah. those months that you spent will be days for us. So we appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you.